Willis Franklin Denny II was born in Louisville, Georgia in 1874. He attended a military school in Atlanta and then Mercer University in Macon. In 1892, he entered Cornell University to study architecture. Denny came on the scene when architecture was adopting new materials and techniques, and at the same time, looking for models from the past to follow. After employment as a draftsman, he began his own practice in 1897, proving adept in many styles and capable of handling both small residences and large public buildings. His designs include the Inman Park United Methodist Church, the Kriegshawber House, the Piedmont Hotel, and the Jefferson County Courthouse in his hometown. When Denny first met with Rhodes to discuss a house, we do not know whether his client referred the architect to a specific castle in Germany as a model to follow, but the Romanesque revival style would have been familiar to Denny. One of the most influential architects of the 1880s was H. H. Richardson, who was the hand behind many prominent buildings in the Northeast and Midwest. These structures were notable for their towers and turrets, round arches and squat columns, sculpture and rough stone. His most famous work is Trinity Church in Boston. Denny would take up many of Richardson's Romanesque revival themes but inventively embrace others, including the French chateau look. What started as a fanciful notion as Rhodes stood on the deck of a Rhine River boat would rise from a vacant lot on Peastree Street to become one of Georgia's most famous homes. This is made of good old Stone Mountain granite. Um, it is one of the sturdiest homes here in the city of Atlanta for sure. And um, it has weathered you know, many storms over the years. But many people are surprised to hear that it is made with many local materials um, here from Georgia. Willis Denny did a great job designing this building because it is built so solidly. Uh, it is a structural granite building from Georgia granite. Uh, it is a low maintenance building really in terms of just your yearly maintenance. Uh, the roof is a slate roof. It's the original slate roof that's been on the building since 1904. Uh, it has a number of strange conditions that do cause leaks from time to time that we have to keep addressing. Uh, but the, win the windows, the original oak windows that were put in the building in 1904, so it's an extremely solidly built building, um, and, and I predict with good stewardship it could really be around for a thousand years. Denny was paid a flat fee of $1,000 to draw up the plans and supervise the construction. Several months before work began, Rose had set his sights along the northern reaches of Peachtree Road beyond the Atlanta city limits. With both a luxurious retirement home and a promising investment in mind, Rhodes purchased Landlot 108, a 114-acre tract, for about $15,000. Peachtree Road runs along a ridge, and the upper floors of the future Rhodes home would enjoy commanding views east and west. A.G. would call his final home La Reve, or The Dream.
Construction began in 1901 and would continue for two years. For both interior and exterior work, Rhodes would spend about $50,000. As much as possible, supplies would come from local wholesalers. The most abundant material, granite, came from Stone Mountain, just a few miles east of Atlanta. Denny had chosen this material for some of his other projects, as had the builders of the Brooklyn Bridge and the national capital in Cuba. Rhodes Hall actually took about two years to construct. Um, this is not your typical stick frame, stick build home. Um, when you're dealing with, you know, Stone Mountain granite that was hauled over here in 500 pound blocks by horse and buggy, and um, not a typical architectural style that most of the workers here in Atlanta were used to dealing with, it did take a much longer time period, about two to three times longer, to build this home than it would have any other home in Atlanta. While steam engines could do some heavy lifting, the precision laying of stone and mortar and the careful pointing that followed could only be performed by skilled laborers. The wood framing within the walls could not begin until the granite blocks were in their last stage. For the roof, Denny chose red slate and copper. The house caused a sensation even before it was complete. A story in the Atlanta Journal in January of 1903 said the home would be one of the most palatial in the South. Finally, in June of that year, work on the interior could begin. W.F. Denny's design called for a large dominant room on most of the floors. This, of course, harkens back to the great halls and the medieval castles, the residence of a lord and his retainers. The ground floor, the basement, and the second floor all do have large central rooms. That was very typical of the time period. Um, the interior of the home is very Victorian in design, and it was all about formal spaces and easy movement throughout the house itself. So you have a lot of formal spaces, whereas the more lived-in spaces were much, much smaller. Clearly, it was A.G. Rhodes's intention to literally outshine all the other homes of wealthy Atlantans. Electricity had recently become available to private homes, and Rhodes ordered the installation of over 300 permanent light fixtures. However, because electricity was still new, and Mr. Rhodes was quite skeptical of this newfangled thing called electricity, he actually had a gas backup system installed in the home, um, you know, should the electricity ever go out. And many of our sconces that you'll see throughout the home actually do have one sconce that looks like a light bulb is out. That's not the case. That's actually the gas backup for the home itself. The main room of the ground floor originally held a heavily carved console table, empire sofa, tufted chair, and grandfather clock. These photo illustrations were commissioned by W.F. Denny to be included in his new portfolio. Today the furniture is gone, but the mirrors, sconces, ceiling coffers, and carved pilaster capitals remain. as does the staircase balustrade and lion newel post, crafted by a local woodcarver who was paid about $300. The parlor is very different than most of the rooms on the ground floor. Um, this was very much a ladies room. It was very formal. 
and finally the grandchildren regarded this as the throne room they were never allowed to come into the throne room and if they were ever being summoned into the throne room by their grandmother they knew that they were in trouble for one reason or the other um, mrs rhodes used the parlor occasionally for hosting her church friends on you know some small gatherings but for the most part it was the least used room in the home itself however their daughter Luanna did eventually marry in the parlor um, she married her second husband in the parlor and had a wonderful reception here in the home